We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Tonight I said, should like to speak as a kind of summing up together my thoughts on these points about Christianity and culture. There are two ways, I feel, to deal with this problem. First, you can ask yourself what is the relationship between the Christian and, or the, not, or the Christian community, in a way that's the same, the Christian or the Christian community, towards the non-Christian environment. So if you are a Christian and you live in a pagan world, you get a place as an ambassador in uh, Pakistan, or in a place like that, that's Muslim, or yeah, you come to another place, which is maybe in another way pagan or non-Christian, what is your attitude? That is the first way in which you can ask it. You can also uh, think about the same problem, but then let's say if you are living in Russia, that means in a country which is very hostile to Christianity, where it is safe not to be a Christian, or if you are a Christian you better hide your Christianity. And there's a kind of way that people there have found a kind of pre-evangelism, that is to live like a Christian without ever saying that you are a Christian. Maybe somebody one day come up to you and say you're different. And then maybe, if it's safe, you can talk about it. That's not the problems that I'm going to deal with today, but nevertheless there are things that we got to think about. But I think it's more difficult to live as a Christian in the world in which we are living today in the Western world, a world which has been Christian, but now can be called post-Christian. There are many forms of society, of morals, of customs, of way of doing things, are still more or less the fruits of Christianity, the fruits of what Christians in the past have achieved. And then very often it is just difficult to draw the lines. Where can I be with it? Or where should I say no? Uh, not so long ago in Holland there was quite a big discussion because for the first time in history, at least recent history, the Queen did not end her yearly speech, uh, her throne speech as we call it, which is the beginning of the parliamentary year in which the government sets out the, game, the, the aims and goals of coming year. And that speech, which is read by the Queen, always ends by a phrase like, and we will do this with, by the help of God, or with the help of God. Now this year that was omitted. And many people cried out that's blasphemous and, and that can be done and it should be there because always have been there and we cannot be a, a country without Christianity because this proves at least that we are some ways Christian. And I always was wondering, is this right? 
because maybe we should be happy that if you have a government which is totally committed to not being a Christian, that to have there this phrase which becomes very hypocritical if in none of your actions you ever think about that. And maybe it's better to admit it, it's more honest. Now that's not totally true that the people are not committed to Christianity, some of the ministers are Christians. So you come caught in a dilemma, and I think these questions are very difficult indeed. And this is just one little instance in the public domain, in the private lives, it's just the same. Where do you draw the lines? What can you accept? What, what do you not accept? Where do you go with the other people and do the same as they do? And where you say, no, I'm not doing that. And uh, I'm, I will, I'm, I'm, I'll take the burden to be different. And of course, we're fighting for it. This is, I think, one way of approach to the problem of Christianity and culture. The Christian in a non-Christian world. You can approach that problem of Christianity and culture in another way and ask the question, what is Christianity producing itself? In a way, you can look at culture as a fruit of Christianity, in a way as a fruit of a fruit of Christianity. You have the Christian, he shows fruits in his personal life, and other Christians do the same. Together they fight against evils, together they try to do the good, and out of this comes something that is a healing factor in society, and out of that may grow certain patterns and customs, and in such a way they may be showing the fruits of the fruits are Christian, and that those, let's say, secondary fruits is what we can call Christian culture. And, of course, if we talk about the Western world as Christian culture, we can think about something like this, in just between parentheses. If people say Christianity has never achieved something, I think it has achieved something, and I would say just look at our Western culture. Of course, many things that we just considered to be totally normal are fruits of Christianity. In the end, I will talk about some of this, but certainly, for instance, if you want to have a passport, you just go to a locker somewhere in some office and you ask for your passport, then you will get it, if you have the legal papers. And so, you will do in Holland. But if you do the same in Indonesia, or somewhere else in Asia, or in many, many other places in the world. And not only today, but in all of history, if you tried to do something as easy as this, and you came to the lock and said, may I have my passport? And the man would say, I'm sorry, uh, I can't help you, you've got to go to the other one. And if you come to the other one, you're sent to another one. And if you send, come to the other one, you're sent to another one. And then you enter by the first one, and he sends you on to the second one. Because everybody understands that on the way, you just have got to lay down some money, and so you go there and you lay down an envelope and the envelope has, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, hundred dollars or something and then the man says, oh yes, of course, I can help you come to back tomorrow. And then you come back tomorrow and he asks you to a higher person and then you have more money. And then in that way you can very easily get the passport. That's the only way to get it. And in many, many countries in the world it has been like this. This is normal within parenthesis. But the normalcy of our Western world is a fruit of Christianity, and we must cherish it. That was an in-between. What about culture? Culture is a difficult word, and much has been studied. Usually, and I think, I even suspect the people who invited me and gave me this very honorable place to talk about Christianity and culture here in this course, the, I think that many, that most of them have thought about culture in a, th in a way that I think is wrong. They thought about culture as, in a very restricted sense. Culture is uh, scholarship and the arts. The question is, what kind of scholarship? In a way you can define it, those things that are totally out of the realities of life. A little embellishment, those things that you can never take serious. That is culture. You see, you have reality, you have economics, you have technology, you have uh, sociology, you have uh, the political sciences, and then we go into those things that some people uh, take up as a hobby, and that is culture, and those people, well, that's culture. Uh, embellishment of life. And that field, 
exactly this restricted field of culture defined in this way the Christians have left too easily in the 18th century when in the 18th century people began to develop this new idea of culture and there are some good books on this subject and I'm not going to expand on it they thought well that's a worldly field and so they left it and so in the world of culture Christians have meant very little culture in this very restricted sense mm -hmm. and as I said this morning if we have a very extreme and violent non anti or Christian a non-Christian or anti-Christian art today in these very extreme radical forms then you got to know it's like that because Christians were never there because we thought it's not important it's worldly as such and I think we have been wrong in doing that and in a way we have to bear the blame we shall we ought to be we should be there where the front line is I think there's a big battle the battle that we are called to fight between, let's say, the line of Cain and the line of Seth, between those who are, let's say, the seed of the woman in the line of um, those who don't don't follow God and the seed of who come out of the woman and look forward to the coming of Christ, to the real fulfillment and the real uh, future. This battle is going on in history, you can't see antithesis or whatsoever, you can give it many names, but in that battle we should be there where the front line is. And I think that the front line today and in the 19th century was very much in the field of culture, and we were simply not there. And that's why these fields have been completely taken up by the non-Christians, that mean that the non-Christians have a strong voice in this world because today we begin to realize that radio, television, film, and all these things are the most strong means of, and the, st the strongest media to bring over a message in a non-discursive way. The message just by programs of entertainment or otherwise, or maybe just informative programs, educational programs, in all kinds of ways, a kind of view on reality, a kind of non-Christian religion is brought over and we're simply not there because we opted out a long, long time ago. We were not there on the front line when the battle was fought. And I think that it is a shame that it was like that. Nevertheless, tonight I'm not going into this type of problem. I think about culture in another way. Culture is the creation of life's forms, the customs, the institutions, it's our way of dealing with nature. Nature. It is the realization of the potentialities and the possibilities that God laid in his creation and laid it open for man to be opened up, to be realized, to be created. Man is a creature in God's creation. And man, in principle and in the first place, is a cultural being. God made the arms, and a wise man in the long, long dim past said, look at the arms and get wise. Well, but the arms, they walk in their ways. And why do they walk in their ways, and why we still can look at the arms as Solomon was looking at the arms, because the arms always walk, walk in a certain way. They walk and they go by instinct. It's their instinct that teaches them how to do it. And their instinct is perfect. The bees, of course, everybody talks about the bees and the honeycomb as well. It's perfect, but it is given by God as an instinct. But God put man in the world and he, he didn't tell him anything. A man had to invent houses, had to invent clothes, he had to invent shoes. And God said, that's, that's your creativity. You don't have instincts, but you, you've got to be creative. And these things that we're talking about are culture. Man has to make his environment. Man has to make himself a home. In the small sense of the word and in the large sense of the word. Organize a country. Organization. There's nothing more cultural than organization. And to make an organization of, of a country, state-wise, <coughs> institutes-wise, like this institute, is a cultural activity. 
and we are cultural beings. Adam began with, to do with this when he gave name to the animal. He began to organize. He began to, to lay down things. And of course, writing was invented later, and music was invented, or discovered rather than invented. We discovered the possibilities, and that's why it is all silly. I have no better word for it. It's silly if Christians despise culture, because they cannot avoid being cultural, because man is a cultural being. And if we say culture, of course, is not our cause, then usually people mean culture in a narrow sense, I've talked about before, but it means that we are not interested in these things, but that doesn't mean that we don't do it, because you cannot avoid culture. And if you're not thinking about culture, not working in culture, the result is poor culture. It's not, not culture, but it is poor culture. So if somebody says, I'm a evangelist, I'm not interested in the arts, I'm said you're a fool because the first thing that you do when you have your um, evangelistic drive, the first thing is you do, you put up a tent and there's music inside. But it's poor music because you never thought about it. And you hand out a folder to attract the crowd to your little tent. But the, pole, the folder is poor in its layout and in the thing that's on front. Many people are even offended by the things that you present just because you never thought about it, because you think culture is out. But the result is poor culture. It's not no culture, but it's poor culture. And so I think that we've got to be very careful. If we say, we are not cultural beings, culture is not our task, and say, but you cannot avoid it. Or, what often happens, just because we, not, we are not thinking about it, we just take things over from the world. And sometimes you think of those you find in the homes of people that are really fine Christians, but in the very narrow sense, the narrow-minded sense of doing away with the things of the culture, you find things that you're really surprised, because you find things that you would never think to find, or things that you would say, but that's not something that a Christian can have in his home, because it belongs now really to the world. We has never thought about it. He just takes unwittingly, unthinkingly, but very naively things out of the world. So exactly with those who are really anti-intellectual, anti-cultural, in those places you find rock in the church. But that communicates spiritual and creative poverty, and it creates a poor lifestyle. And a lifestyle, of course, is maybe the deepest and the most important, even if the last fruit of culture. Christians, and it's not only our century, but it's way back in history, Christians have been ascetic. They have played the ascetic. They have gone out of culture. But we must understand to be an ascete is a pattern of culture. Because you cannot avoid being a cultural being. So, we see in the beginning of Christianity, under the influence of Gnosticism, and under other influences, that Christians began to retreat in the desert, be holy in the desert, far away from culture. This is one of the most influential, most important cultural influences that comes out of early Christian culture. So these people retreated from culture and they became a very influence, great influence of culture. Out of this grew the monastic movement. And of course, the whole Middle Ages is unthinkable without the monastic movement. And if we see what the monasteries and the monastery orders were doing, then I would say, it's great. And what they were doing was cultural. They educated people, they dried up the lands, they cultivated the lands. And in many cultures of Europe, as in my own country, we say, thank you for the work that the monks have done. Nevertheless, it was a retreat from culture. It's a kind of strange of dichotomy. On the one hand, they were doing so much, and on the other hand, they were so holy and out of the world. And that means that at a certain time when society was developing, and they didn't need it anymore, the monks, to do the work, they could do it themselves. It was completely secularized. The early, the earliest European universities, 12th century, Bologna, Paris, they were all very much geared to a non-Christian way of thinking. 
because there was no Christian way of thinking that was for the monks. And so he had from the very beginning the division between something Christian, that's for the monks and the ecclesiastical people, and something else for the other people. And I think that this secularization which took place so early is a result of this going back from the early Christians. So on one hand we are thankful, but on the other hand we also have questions. The Renaissance is a fruit of, of probably the monastic culture just in its negative aspect. And of course from the Renaissance you go into the modern era. So we cannot avoid culture. And we must understand that the principles that we have, that the principles on which we act, the principles with which we deal and the way we handle the world, that if these principles are wrong, that they break down or that they delay the building up, that you cannot have wrong principles and they have no effect. You see, it may be for some people a shock, but it's one of the greater things in the world that whatever man does, it create, it has, it has meaning, and because it has meaning, it has results. There is a horrible little Zen poems. You know these Zen poems are always very short. And the Zen poem is like this. He jumped in the water. And he caused no ripples. That's a view on man in which what he does cause no ripples. That would be the most awful thing in the world. Of course, in our sinfulness, we always think about that situation. When I was young, there was a kind of pop song, popular little song. If I could be with you one hour tonight, and you wouldn't know the things that I would do, and so on and so on. Well, that's a little dream that a man can have. I can do something and nobody would know. But it never happens like that, because man is meaningful. And whatever we do, it has, it causes ripples. So the Christian poem is, he jumped in the water, and there were ripples. And of course, the ripples are sometimes big and sometimes small. And the ripples, of course, go inside are reinforced by other ripples, or they go against other ripples, and in the end we have storms, movements, great results, maybe small results, because we go against the stream. Whatever it is, but you cannot avoid having ripples. So, we must not think of not having any cultural influence, because it would mean that the Christian is a meaningless person. I may make one remark here at this point, that Christian culture that means culture activity by Christians is always the world. Christ for to work for the world. We are placed in the world. And that is what we have to do. We'll come back to the moment. So, we are not talking about the subculture. Maybe, in a certain situation, it's not avoidable that you have a subculture. You see, if everybody is a non-Christian, let's say if you have a little Christian community in, you cannot avoid being a subculture. In a certain sense, you can avoid it, even in a country like avoid it. But it's not our idea. We don't work for our little in-circle, we work for the world. And we think about the issues of this world. Economic crisis, crime rate, abortion, legal problem. All these problems are just as much or maybe even more our concern than anybody else's. What to do? How to solve? How we can, What are we doing? How are we doing? These questions are there. So, we work the world. You are the soul of the world. And that's your task. To be the soul of the world. Not to be the soul in your little, little, little coin. So, be open. Of course, many people have sung the song of Luther, that we have a little fort, you know the song, have in, um, interpreted it that we build a little fortress of our own. And I would always say, if we make of our Christian community a fortress, then usually it's like this, that, that it really works. It's perfect. It's really perfect, because never anybody from the outside comes inside. Ever ever invite somebody, says, now come over the wall and be just as awful little and small as we are and follow all our do's and don'ts and start living. 
You see, nobody comes over that wall. But we think ourselves to be safe within those and don'ts of the little small legalisms, of the little trite little phrases, the little in talk, the kind of language that we use, which is our in language, so that when somebody comes to church, he says, I didn't understand one word of it. What was the man talking about? Well, he just used all kinds of phrases that everybody understands. In Holland, but not in America, but in Holland, there are even people that are so foolish to evangelize with our old catechism. As if anybody in the world understands the old language. But we must understand that the little fortress is completely ineffective to bring, to, to have out the world. Because if I go on using biblical language, then of course our battle is, as we read in Ephesians 6, against the powers in the heavenly. So we have the aeroplanes over our head and we are bombed from, from out of the sky. What do our walls do? Nothing. And we find inside the church, in that sense, we find many, many of the worldly sins. We don't even know it. And the first sin that we have, of course, is the sin of pride. Our nice little church. You see, so we got to be very well, very well concerned with not having a little fortress, not having a little subculture as an ideal. Sometimes it cannot be avoided, and if it's not avoided, then we accept it. Christianity and culture. I have quite a row of book on my shelf about that subject, and most of them begin with a nice little definition of Christianity, and secondly, there's a nice little definition of culture, that half the book. And then, the next part of the book, they try to marry the two. But it never works, because we have be begun to divide the two, and become as a kind of two mythical entities that we want to marry. And it doesn't work. And I've been thinking very much of it, and I've always felt this is the wrong approach. We rather have the question, how do we have to act? It is not that something that goes to something strange, a strange force outside, but it is our action. How does it come that we talk about these two different ways as if they are completely separate, alien things, that we have to get acquainted with each other and try to fuse in some way, get together in some way? Well, I think that there is a confusion here very often between what I began to talk about, the two different approaches, to be a Christian in a non-Christian world, and the activity of the Christian in his own cultural action. And if you begin to confuse the two, you get in confusion, and you don't know where you are anymore. That confusion about these two different approaches to the problem, and I think they're both very real, as a Christian living in a non-Christian world, or as a Christian how do I act, and what am I to do, and where are my priorities? These two different things, if we confuse them, then we get in trouble, and that trouble began already in the early Christian time. The problem was posed in this way, is there a solidarity with the world, yes or no? Do we, are we, have, have, we, have we any solidarity with the world around us, the Roman, Greek culture, or do we try to avoid having anything? Of course, the people that we're discussing at this moment were all culture people who were trained in the schools and universities of the old and ancient Greek Roman world. So they had all the thought forms, all the thought patterns, all the terminology from that background. They could almost not avoid being imbued by it. Every word was loaded by that type of thing. But some said, Let's get out of it. Don't be, don't be, 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 be touched by it. Don't be contaminated by it. And other think, and other people said, but there's so much good in it. And why shouldn't we take it? And this is quite a discussion in the early part of, uh, uh, Christian history. Pokma, one of my good friends, although he's much older than I, uh, man I highly revere, has written about that recently, and he, he writes that, uh, writes about the situation. 
Do we have solidarity with the Israeli Council? Yes or no? And he said there were basically two answers. A more synthetic one, which acknowledges elements of truth in Greek philosophy and wants to make use of it. And secondly, an antithetic attitude which condemns philosophy and the whole of pagan culture and which considers this, uh, considered a training in Greek philosophy to be useless, even dangerous for the Christian. These were the two different attitudes. Those who accepted the first position in one way or another found that their understanding of the Bible was going to be colored from this embracing of the philosophical insights of Plato and others. And they were open to criticism that their thoughts were at some points more like the pagan than an obedience to, Christ, to scripture would allow. There was a real danger there. So, this is Popma again. Both for our understanding of Philo, of Philo, what do you say here? Both for our understanding of Philo theology and our understanding of claimants and origins estimation of culture, it is of the greatest importance to recognize that the syntheses of the latter, which favor cultural solidarity, are based on a purely pagan religious base. So, beware. However, and this is very interesting, this follows, because now, Pop might going to talk about the other people who say, have no solidarity at all. Get out of it. Which seems at first sight to be much more a good and viable option. However, if we look at those who oppose this solidarity and who reject ancient culture, we see that they, in a way, even more than the others, were making a synthesis with ancient culture. And we're working from non-Christian principles. To quote again out of this article, Tetium, Tatianus, how you say that, Tetium, had been struck by the world revelation and he had come to believe in Christ. He had become a Christian. For him, that involved an evaluation of culture characterized by extreme opposition to cultural solidarity. He must have failed to realize altogether that in this way he was actually engaged in bringing about his synthesis. It is evident from his preserved writing that Tatians remained faithful to the subtleties of rhetoric training. But, more important, that his estimation of culture clearly betrays the cynic's marks of contempt of the world. You know the cynic, and you all have heard about Diogenes, the man who went into that barrel and who went out of culture and he despised culture. He was a cynic. That the cynic said, culture is nothing. Well, it's exactly the cynics that influenced Tetzian, and his view on culture was the cynic's view on culture. And so I think it's very important to understand that if Christians say, we don't want to be, be touched by culture, culture is not our brand, we are out of culture, we don't want to deal with culture, that they're not talking in a biblical way, but they're talking in the cynics way, in a Greek, pagan way. And I think it's very important to understand this. So, we should not confuse our attitude to culture with our attitude to the non-Christian or anti-Christian culture. There are two different issues. Our attitude to culture is not the same as the attitude to the world around us. The attitude to the world around us is this, and it's very clearly stated to Christ by, by, by Christ, you are the soul of the world. You have the task to fight corruption. You've got to hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is our attitude to the world around us. And of course it applies also to the world inside, our little church. Nevertheless, we try to build, we try to, to make things, we, we, we are human, we are creative, and we cannot avoid being this. So, we make music. Maybe 
The church is the last and best place in the world where still music is made very much. The other people only listen to the radio and records. We still make it. Every, every Christian meeting is, let's sing a hymn. What are we singing? Why are we singing? How are we singing? Well, I think we got to pause a little bit and think about it. Of course, it's easy to say that these people are Tessian and Origin and claimants that they were wrong. And I don't want to throw stones. We got to have a high regard for their achievements. And of course, they were not wicked people, nor stupid people, but they were fighting to try to understand the problem and to solve the problem. And of course, as I said the other day, we are always just moving a little bit out of the thought and patterns and the cultural patterns of our own time and the difference is what come. It is very difficult to get rid of some things in our culture and to add something new. That's our creativity, that's our work, but it means that for a large part we are just as a surrounding culture and let's say be thankful for that even if sometimes we don't want it, nevertheless it is like this and therefore we can communicate with the man or woman aside of us because we have so much in common. Nevertheless, the differences count. So we are asked to be sorting salt, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We are asked to be prophets. We must understand that the Bible is full of evangelists, but their names are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Malachi, just read Malachi and consider that to be a little tract issued by a little tract society 400 BC and it's fantastic what you read fantastic, that is what it is and they were fighting against the wickedness of their days so we're not throwing stones but we must understand that the Bible itself is never critical of culture, you cannot find one anti-critic, anti-cultural statement in the Bible. Solomon built the most fantastic temple ever built and he built something which was totally and fully within the God-given Hebrew children of God covenant church community. That's where he built the, the, the temple. How did he do it? He hired a man from, what was it, Tyrus or Sidon. And that's where the architect came from and that's where the workman came from. And he just let them go. Very interesting. And nowhere in the Bible finds them, you're wicked, you hide the world, that you can't be done this, you can't be doing. If you read about Babel, we read many things about Babel, but we never read that Babel was wicked because it was such a highly cultured country. The cities of Babel, the city of Sidon and Tyrus, you even have Jeremiah and Ezekiel weeping about the downfall of these beautiful cities. And they are beautiful cities according to the Bible. The Bible says something else. It doesn't say beware of Babel because it's a cultural city, but it said beware of their gods. Beware of their gods. So we are asked always again and again to think about them as something that we have to go. And in a way, I shouldn't take up my little Bible and try to find text. To, to, to make this clear, because the Bible is full of it, of every page. Don't follow other gods. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, and therefore don't follow other gods if you want to live in the land that I've given you. This is the message that begins there, in the very beginning of the Bible, and goes through. I have one little text here, which is completely superfluous to read, Nevertheless, maybe it might be interesting. And it goes about the woman, the woman which is Israel. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread my skirt over you, covered your nakedness. 
Yes, I plight my trust to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed up your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shot you with leather. I swore you with fine linen and covered you with silk. Cultural things, beautiful cloth. That's what the Lord is giving. And I decked you with ornaments and bracelets on your arm and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown upon your head. Thus you were decked with gold and silver, and your raiment was of the fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth, and you ate fine flour and onion oil, and you grew exceedingly beautiful and came to regal estate. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, because it was perfect to the splendor which I had bestowed upon you, says the Lord God. That's a description of what God is doing to his people. It's culture. But then, as the story goes on, you also took your fair jewels of my gold and my silver that given you and made for yourself images of man. And with them you played the harlot. And that's the message we have over and over in the Bible. Never go to the other gods. They are false gods. Don't follow false for of the other gods. And again, I don't feel that I have to give a Bible study to go through all the Bible and all the passage where it says, don't follow the other gods because it will be the end of you. It's never against culture. What are today's gods? Are the images of gold and silver? Maybe, yes. But their names are different. Their monies are, their names today, the gods of today are money, power, sex, pleasure. The Tao index is maybe the best indication of what we're talking about. If we talk about the gods of today, it's their index. Ba Babel, if we read about it in the whole Bible, had become a metaphor of evil culture. And if we read about it in Revelation 18, then we read about Babel as the great metaphor of the evil city and it's filled with tyrants it's an evil city but we also read that all the merchants of the earth were going to weep and mourn for her because there were cargoes of gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen all kinds of scented wood, articles of ivory, of coastly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice and it's fantastic, and it's meant to be fantastic, and it's not said the city is wicked because of this. But it goes on. There were cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, yes, and slaves, that is, human souls. And there we began to get the, into the problems. It is a city, but it's a nation. And, and they asked all the other nations to drink the wine of her impure passions. They wanted to have fornication. And people want to be rich in the dealing with human souls. And so the whole thing comes down to this, get out of her, says the Lord. But to get out of her is don't take part of her sinful works. It doesn't mean get out of culture and never touch anything like that. And basically, if I look around, even in the smallest and the most restricted anti-cultural little group, that we can find in America, they nevertheless have clothes, and they nevertheless eat, and they nevertheless probably have some jewels of some kind. Probably cheap ones, because they never thought about it. This is the anti antithesis, not culture and Christianity, that's not the antithesis, but the antithesis idolatry and sin on the one side, and God's way the obedience to God on the other side. Idolatry and sin versus God's ways, in the ways of obedience. Not culture and Christianity. That's not an antithesis. Come out of her, whatever that may mean, can never mean don't care. Let it go. Be away from it. It's an evil world. Don't touch. Christ. 
had his share in this. He was eating with the prostitutes, and the people came to him and said, How can you eat with these people? They are prostitutes, don't you know it? He says, I know very well, they are the people who need me. And so he was there. And of course, if you want to work, then you've got some time to, to make your hands dirty, otherwise you never achieve anything. And Christ was not afraid to get dirty hands. So, we, we sometimes have to go and to, to care for this world. This morning already I quoted an, an, an article by C.S. Lewis, and I'd like to quote it again. C.S. Lewis said, we don't need little, more little books on Christianity, of, of Christianity. We don't need these little books. What we need is books on biology and on, uh, on geology and on art and on philosophy and so on and so on, and sociology. So that if whenever you go to a shop and want to get a good introduction into a certain field, you get a Christian book in your hand. That's a dream. It's a creative dream. And of course today we cannot have it. Maybe we can have it in 25 years from now, but then we got to start. And in some places we really got to make a start. In this place maybe we began to already make a little start. But we got to do it. And and it means because we care for the world. Of course, Christ said, and this is the great prayer of Christ, as the high priest, you know, at the, uh, at the table, his last table, the last supper, he prayed. And his prayer said, do, I do not pray to take them out of the world. And if Christ says, I do not pray to take them out of the world, we are not going to be out, going out of the world. But he said, I pray for them that they keep them from the evil one. That's something else. And if you say, the world is the evil, then you talk the cynics talks, the talk of the ancient Greek, not of Christianity. So what we are called to do is to do our task as cultural beings, to realize the possibilities and to fight against the evil. Laughing has added since the fall. That means a long, long time ago. It's nothing new. So realizing the possibilities and the fight against evil, we do care. Again, we are asked to be prophets to say it's wrong. And spirituality means not to go out of the world. I'm almost afraid to say it again, but Christ died in order that we may live, that we may be human. And of course that was not just something for the individual. Of course Christianity, particularly in this country, is often too individualistic. We are only interested in the individual, but it's much more. It is for the community, it's for the country. So Christianity and culture in my mind, is not a problem at all. In the academic sense, there is no problem of Christianity and culture. It simply doesn't exist. Christianity and culture is just simply life's issue. And as such, there is a high tension. But the tension is never to be resolved by any academic means because it's a tension between the acceptance and the non-acceptance. We accept this world out of the hands of God and we say, thank you, it's beautiful, it's your gift. We, we accept, maybe with tears, but nevertheless we accept that man is sinful and that we die and that other people die and that it never will be perfect. We accept the fact that there is sin because we wait on the Lord till he finishes with it and the world will be clean. We look forward to it. Because, and that's the third point, or maybe the second, we follow our Lord who said, and I don't accept. And so our Lord Jesus Christ said, and I'm not accepting the poverty and death. Christ was angry at the tomb of Lazarus. He was angry, and he wept, but he was real angry, and he said, no. And he was a protester. And we are following him, and we protest against the world, and so we don't accept the evil, even if we accept it. That's a tension. When do we accept it in a positive sense? When are we lenient? When are we long-suffering? And when do we say no? 
even fighting for it. Well, it's very hard. That's wisdom. The wisdom for which we pray. The wisdom for which we read our Bibles. For which Proverbs and many other books were written. The wisdom to know how to deal. That's life's option. It's not a theoretical problem. In that sense, it can never be solved. But there's one thing that is very, very important to understand. It's not just bad morals that we're fighting against, but false religion is the source of evil. That is how the Bible talks about it. False religion, that's the thing that Christ said, don't. So the problem that we're talking about, if there is a problem, but certainly the problem in our personal lives, is to be solved in Christ. We got to understand the right priorities. Christ said, at the end of the great, great Sermon on the Mount, He said, Seek the kingdom of God. And for the rest it doesn't matter. No, He didn't say that. And the rest will be given to you. I know what you mean. Don't be afraid. But seek the kingdom of God. Those who go away and leave father and mother and friends and houses and everything for my sake. What's going to happen to them? What is going to happen to them? Well, we can read about that in a very interesting little text that I want to read to you in Mark 10, 28. Mark 10, 28. It is a parallel text to the one I just mentioned in Mark, uh, in Matthew. Mark 10, 28. Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brother, or sister, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold. Now, in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, maybe with persecutions, it's not always nice. And in this age, and in the age to come, there will be eternal life. And in this time these things are coming. And it is the great mistake of all these mystics and all these ascetic people who say, don't, don't touch. Because it's so dangerous to be touched. And they are right. It's almost impossible not to get touched by the ways of this world. It's almost impossible that you get completely clean out of the battle. Happily, with forgiveness of sins for that. But Christ says, seek the kingdom first, and all these things, food and clothes, shall be yours as well. And in the concrete explanation that we just read, it says, houses and lands, now, in Jesus' name, in this time. It is a tragedy of this seed that he's left out these words in this life. He explained in a way, he explained in a way, and he didn't understand that if we leave things in the name of Jesus, that God is giving it back. If we have no false gods before us and know our priorities, and the priority is don't follow the, false, follow the false gods, that's negative, and go with Christ, that's positive, and give everything to Him. And then, if we do that, if we say the kingdom of God is first, then we can engage in cultural activities, our creativity in using God given possibilities. There may be a warning that there may be persecution. There is a chance that in all reality we will have to lose maybe all things, even our lives, even our, just because our priorities went right. But even then the promise holds, because there's a great future. So there are two ways open for the Christian. One, the way that leads to the narrow gate. And there's an open and an easy road, and that road leads to destruction, that's what Christ said. What is the narrow gate? It's not the denial of the fact that the gospel is open for everybody, and that we only have to present ourselves to the Lord, and that we have to offer nothing. 
It's not because we are so fantastic good people that we go through the narrow gate. But the narrowness is exactly this, that we have to go through it, leaving our pride, our self-reliance, our autonomy behind. And everybody knows that it's exactly the most difficult things for Christians and for people who become Christians. It's much easier to, if I would say, if you want to be saved, I know a perfect way. Climb the highest mountain of the Himalaya naked. Everybody will be climbing there. Fantastic nudist camp. Because if you reach this, the top, you, you got to have, you have it. You have it, eternal life. But then you can stand before God and say, I did it! And that's exactly God said, I don't want you to. You just go through the narrow gate. Forget about it. You can never add something to it. But if you do that, then I can give you give power to do that. And I give you everything you need. We ask people, well, if you ask great things, people come. But it's so easy. Yes, it's easy because we got to put our priorities right. And the priority is seek the kingdom of God first and forget about yourself. The choice is not a religious one. It is a choice of our, the fullness of our lives. The Bible talks about the fruits and the fruits of the Spirit. In our age, we would call it culture. It's just another name for the same thing. God comes with his judgment over the world. We read about it in the Old Testament. We read about it in the New Testament. We read about it in Revelation. God is coming with his judgment over this world in the here and now. But it's not our work, it's his work. It's beyond our responsibility. We cannot judge, he judges. Very interesting little thought. Great thought. When I just became a Christian, of course, you become Christian on a sufficient base. It's foolish to accept the Bible if you don't believe in it. So I accepted the, ba the Bible completely, but I made one little exception. That must be a little interpolation of later. That's a foolish little thing, but of course I don't have to believe it. There's so much that's good, so I forget about this one little thing. And that's a silly story of Noah's Ark and then coming down to close the door. Can you imagine the great God Almighty coming down to close the door? <laughs> Later on I began to realize something else, that that's exactly the greatest moment maybe in the whole Bible. Noah said, built the ark, and there he was, and then the waters rose. Somewhere down here, Somewhere in a park like this, there's the boat, and the water's rising, and everybody trying to cling to some, some ways, uh, making some, some rafts and so on. And what do you do when you are Noah standing on the ark? You are human. There's only one thing to do, that is throw out lifelines and save people. But God says, no, I don't want people to be saved. It's my judgment. And that's why God closed the door. Nobody can close the door but God himself, because he is the judge. We are there to save. So it's not our work, it's God's work. And we are not going to be the judges. We've got to understand this. But God is doing it. We are called to help our fellow beings. And therefore the dilemma that Camus poses in his book, The Plague, and of course I'm talking about this tension of acceptance and non-acceptance in a practical way. If you read in Camus' book about the plague, there is this dilemma. Do we listen to the priest who says it's God's judgment? Or do we follow the... Uh, the, the doctor who is fighting the disease. And I think there's no dilemma for the Christian. We say we are both. And we can fight the results of that and nevertheless preach. God is working. The Christian community has a very special place in the midst of all these hardships of God's Wrath over this world. Christ is reigning this world with an iron rod. Stands somewhere in Re Revelation. And we see it around us. War, famine, death. Just reach your paper. But the Christians, they are sealed. Of course, it's a reminding of the sealing in the houses of, Is of, the houses of Israel in Egypt. In that same way, 
And there's the great promise, the great promise that was once given to Baruch, if I pronounce that name right. This man who was a secretary to the greatest evangelist of that age, Jeremiah. And he began to write down these uh, uh, beautiful sermons, messages, pamphlets, little uh, tracts that Jeremiah wrote. He had the task to write them down. And it not, was not so nice to write them down because it meant it's finished. And so one day God came to him and said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And this was a very special, very special message of God to Baru. In the midst of all this, I will take care of you. But don't look for great things. Don't look for great things. Wait, because I will take care of you. Somewhere else in the Bible, in Sephaniah 2, 3, we read this. In the same, same situation, if God is coming with his judgment, as I see it, as he is coming now upon our Western nations, and our Western culture, which has said, we don't need God anymore, we cannot go on for two centuries, <clears throat> just saying we don't need God, we will do it ourselves, and then go on in doing the one sin against the other, and the one iniquity and the other, and as I said this morning, I make something body like the Godfather and our hero and saint. We cannot go on without that God is coming with his judgment, but if he comes, then this is the message to the Christian. Seek righteousness and seek humility. You are not going to build up a great future. Endure own utopias, they don't ever come up by. But seek righteousness, do your work. And of course, that's a cultural task, nevertheless, just the same. So there is a time that God says, I'm going to take care of you. But that doesn't mean that God says, and so forget about the world and let it go, and let it die in its own sins, because it would be sin itself. I should like to end with a very, very little, short, I will make it little and short, I promise you, Bible study. Very short. It is about Revelation 12, a woman in the wilderness. And <clears throat> I should like to go in depth into this, but I won't, just because that would be not nice to you, you're listening long enough. And I don't want to be more notorious about the length of our lectures than I already am. So, Revelation 12. Um, just a moment. A beautiful, beautiful story. It begins with the woman. The woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child and she cried out in the pangs of birth and anguish for delivery. Who is that woman? She is the same woman that we already read about in Ezekiel. She is the Christian community. It is the, the people that God has called forward. And this people in the Old Testament was, was, was full, pregnant of the coming Messiah. And so there she was. And then one day the coming Messiah was coming. And then, at that moment, and I'm not going to read all of this, you can read it for yourself, although it's not too long, there came the great red dragon with seven heads and seven horns and so on. And if you read about it, you understand it's the old dragon, it's the devil, it's the great adversary to God, it is the great, great evil, the mighty evil one. And she, the woman, brought forth a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. I referred to this text a few moments ago. But the dragon is there. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So, in a very short span, in one little sentence here, you have the full life of Christ, his death and resurrection, and he's brought back to God and his throne. Where is the woman? Where is the woman? two things about the woman. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. The woman in the wilderness. 
Then the next passage deals with a mighty battle in the heavens between this, this dragon and Michael, the archangel. And the end of it is that the accuser of our brother is thrown to the earth. The devil is thrown out of the heavens. Christ already talked about it. We see now the fulfillment of it. But then I read now from verse 13 on, and it picks up where we just have left. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had born the main child. Christianity now. The people of God, they had brought forth the Messiah, and now she is there. A woman who has brought forth a child, but the child is gone. And she is pursued by the dragon. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly from the serpent to the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nursed for a time, times and a half a time. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth out of the woman to sweep her away in with the flood. But the earth came to help of the woman. I always think that this is just the people, the great multitude who doesn't like that the Christians are uh, persecuted. You always see that the people stand against it in the earth. The earth came to help of the womb, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river which the dragon had poured out from his mouth. And then he began to follow the, uh, the little people, the rest of her offspring. Those who keep the commandments of God and be a testimony to Jesus. The woman in the wilderness, a beautiful, a beautiful image of Christianity and culture. The wilderness? And you'll be talking about those beautiful things, earrings and fine silk and good food and beautiful houses and fine music. Wilderness? And I think we got to understand this in the light of the Bible, because the Bible talks about the wilderness. Yes, it talks about it in our three or four texts to read here. First, again, Ezekiel. How does the Bible talk about wilderness? Of course, the Bible is full of the image of the wilderness, and every time and again, to begin with, when the people of Israel was going through the desert, the wilderness is a place of testing. Again, yes, it is a place of testing, but it's more than just a place of testing. And we read about it, for instance, here, I hope I wrote it back, down right, or is it? Ezekiel 34, 25, and on. And I will make with them a covenant of peace, and banish wild beasts from the land, so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places around them about my hill a blessing, and I will send down showers in their seasons, and they will send showers of blessing, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and it shall be secure in their lands, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I break the bars of their yoke, and deliver them from the hands of those who enslave them, and they shall be no more a prey to the nations, and so on. I, and I will provide for them prosperous plantations, so that they will in no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations, I did not know that I am the Lord. You see, this is the wilderness, a place which God makes beautiful. It's just like Christ says, know the right priorities, seek the kingdom of God, and I will give it to you. Of course. Don't you know? Look at the little, little animals, the little birds. Didn't God make them beautiful? They don't work for it. And how about you? Well, God doesn't give you instincts. You have culture. You've got to work for it. But nevertheless, I will give you all the possibilities and everything that you need. Hosea. Hosea 2, 14 and on. Therefore, and he talks about the Christian community again. 
as a woman. This is very often in the Bible. I don't need to expound on this. And here again, therefore, behold, I will lure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. That's the way the Lord wants his bride to be. And there, in the wilderness, I will give her vineyards and I will make the valley of acre a door of hope. And there he, she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came out of Egypt. Then I will give her all these things. Isaiah, just to end with, 32, Isaiah 32, 15, Isaiah 32, 15, it talks about God's wrath, tremble your woman, shudder your complacent one, strip, make yourself bare. A good sack upon your loins, beat upon your breast, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people, they will be forsaken. They will be a joy for wild asses, a pasture of their flock. Until the spirit with a big ass, until the spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Then justice will help dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field. It becomes parallel, the wilderness and the fruitful field. So if we talk about a woman in the wilderness, it means that there's a woman, and that's a Christian community who knows the priorities, who knows that maybe you have to flee, but you flee to a place that God has given us, a wilderness. And God says there in the wilderness, I will give you everything you need. Don't be afraid. Don't be anti-cultural. Because then you begin to forsake. And you begin to be bare. And you begin to be too low. Poor culture. Subculture. Let there be bad words. Look for the great thing. That God has given you. If you seek the kingdom first. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.